All right, we're live. Woo! Hi, everyone. Welcome to Teach the Web Talks, our monthly talk series where we connect with experts from all over the world uh, who share a skill for the mentor community about how we can be better event runners and teachers of the web. So today uh, we are here with two amazing people. But before they we introduce them, I'm gonna let you know who I am. My name is Lucy Harris. I uh, work for Webmaker at Mozilla, and I'm going to be one of your hosts. Hi, and I'm Sarah Allen, and I also work for Webmaker for Mozilla, and I'm based in London, England. Oh, yeah, and I'm based in Toronto, Canada, where it is very, very cold. So we are here with two people from 100 Cameras, Angela and JP. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves, say who you are, where you're from, and uh, what you do at 100 Cameras. Okay. Oh, JP, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> sorry, my name is Angela, and I am one of the founders of 100 Cameras and work in the day-to-day -day as kind of our chief storyteller, and I live in... Awesome. Uh, and my name is JP. I am based in uh, New York as well. New York, New York, myself, uh, Manhattan, and I am the photography education coordinator for 100 Cameras. And I'm also uh, the owner of JP Teaches Photo. So we teach uh, photography classes both online to people around the world and uh, in person here in New York City. Awesome. Welcome, guys. So for anyone who's watching, who this is their first Teach the Web talk, uh, we really encourage you throughout this talk to send us your questions, and we will ask them. You can send us your questions in three ways. Uh, one, you can tweet at us using the hashtag TeachTheWeb. You can also get to us on Discourse. So if you go to Webmaker Prototypes Discourse, you'll be able to uh, send us your questions there. And if you're watching us live, the easiest way is to use the Q&A feature. Your questions will pop up right in this talk, um, and we'll be able to ask them live. So hopefully you'll have some questions that you can share. This call is going to be recorded so that you can watch it after the fact if you're not able to join us live. Um, and we'll be turning it into a podcast as well. So exciting stuff. As usual, uh, we first want to get to know the people we're talking to, so we have prepared some excellent icebreaker questions. Everybody's favorite. <laughs> OK, question number one. When is the first time you ever picked up a camera? Let's start with Angela. All right, um, so mine was in elementary school, and it was a Polaroid camera. I got it for my birthday from my grandmother, and I was pretty obsessed with it. It was $10 for 10 pieces of film, so I would save up all of my allowance money to then take my 10 Polaroids of some pretty random things. I still have some of them, um, and yeah, that was my first time. That's amazing. Polaroids are making a comeback, I'm sure of it. That was definitely the most fun way. Do you still have that camera? <laughs> I do, I do. It's at my parents' house in Tallahassee. Um, I found it when they told me I finally had to clean out everything from my closet. From <laughs> That's amazing. Um, JP, what about you? Now you teach photography. When was the first time that you uh, picked one of these things up? Well, my dad was actually a photography enthusiast. I can't say he was a photo actual photographer and never got paid to take pictures, but he did really enjoy it. And so I, um, first time I picked up a camera was, you know, finding his camera laying around the house, and it was an old uh, film SLR camera. I don't even know if I took any pictures with it, um, but I remember it sort of got me really curious about photography, about this little machine that, that uh, he liked to use so much. So that, that was my first time picking up a camera. That's an amazing story. I love all of these old stories. They're perfect. You have people's families are connected. Um, okay, the next one, I'm actually going to start with Sarah, so I don't put you guys on the spot. We'll do Sarah and then me, and then you guys can go. As you're probably aware, in the photography world, Selfies are all the rage. Uh, Sarah, what is your best selfie face? Um, okay, so <laughs> my selfie face now is the casual. It's just kind of small. But I remember when I <laughs> first started taking selfies, I remember reading an article how the Olsen twins, I don't know if you guys know who they are, and these two girls who were actresses, these twins, and apparently they said prune every time they went to say, take a photograph. So my selfie picture was, 
So I stopped doing that now and gone back to the good old fashioned smile. <laughs> what about you? I'm going to steal that. The prune. It's good. Um, I'll admit, I definitely used to like duck face before it was even called duck face. Like, <laughs> like blue steel face. Um, but now I just do the smile, but I've noticed it kind of gives me like pirate eye. Like, oh, like one of my eyes like closes more. I was like, arg. Okay, that's my selfie face. All right, someone else take this. JP, show us your selfie face. Well, so um, I, my friends and I were also very much aware of the uh, prune face and the Olsen twins, uh, and what my friends and I have all do during um, selfies that we take is that we completely exaggerate it, and so all of our vacation pictures, we just look completely ridiculous because we've just stopped trying, essentially, is what it comes down to. And so we try to exaggerate our model poses with our Olsen twins prune faces. So we just essentially make a complete joke out of it. So I will now give you an example of exaggerated prune face. And by the way, the reason they do that, just so everyone is aware, is because apparently it, it's supposed to make you look like you have cheekbones, even oh. with, like exaggerated cheekbones. So that's, that's the whole idea behind it. So you can play around with that on your own. But I will now give you a demonstration of exaggerated prune face. So, Beautiful there you go. Bones. Beautiful cheekbones. <laughs> Thank you. Angela, it's, you knew it was coming. <laughs> it's my turn. And you know what's funny is I don't think I've ever admitted this out loud before, but I always go with a um, surprise face, like, oh, I didn't know this was happening. So it's a little bit of prune with, like, <laughs> wide eyes. So it's something like... Or, you know, eyes go wide and it's like, oh, I didn't know this was happening, although I'm definitely holding the camera and it's reversed camera at my face. But, yeah. <laughs> First From time... photographers, people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is how it's done. Those are amazing. I feel like I've learned a lot about how I'm going to do selfies in the future, which I did not expect to get out of this exercise. Um, okay, and the last one, and ties very well into this, is what is your most embarrassing photo? So either that has been taken of you, or if you've taken of other people, if maybe you don't want to, like, confess about your grade three yearbook picture. Um, I will start with this one again, like, and then we can go with Sarah, we can go reverse order. Reverse order. Um, okay, I was actually going to go with uh, probably... Oh, yeah, you know, I was going to say, like, the grade three one was what I was going to go with, but maybe there's something worse. But I think grade three was about the time I decided that I really wanted to, I hated cutting, uh, brushing my hair, so I decided I wanted it all cut off. My mom was like, are you sure? And I was like, yes. It was just a couple days before yearbook day. I was, like, adamant. I didn't fully grasp that I would have, like, absolutely no hair. So I have, like, a, like a little buzz cut as a grade three for my yearbook picture, which I'm glad was before the time of the internet because you cannot find it. You've been saved. <laughs> well, my embarrassing photographs are before the time of the internet, but my brothers have learned to scan and put up. So you know those embarrassing ones when you're like four or five year old and you're wearing an outfit that looks like it was made out of your granny's curtains? Any of those. <laughs> Perfect. Angela? Um, I'm going to have to go with my extremely awkward years in middle school. Um, it was also when I started to learn the art of baton twirling, and I was Ooh. pretty serious about it. So I did a lot of competitions, and we kind of traveled all over. But in competitions, you have to wear a lot of very sparkly, um, spandexy leotards. And there's just there's so many photos. It's also the year I first got bangs, and I didn't quite know how to manage them. So. There's some pretty awkward posed photos um, with lots of sequins, spandex, and bangs that did not know how to be bangs. Perfect. <laughs> JP, last one. Yeah, so I actually dug this image up. It's a print image, so I won't be screen sharing it. So I hope you guys can see this. Uh, but this is when I was uh, 15. And um, it's not it doesn't look like it's too in focus there, but my, I'm with my beautiful mom. But this was what I call my big glasses Liberace hair phase. And uh, for our listeners, if you don't know who Liberace is, you'll have to Google him. Uh, but that is my most embarrassing photo of all time. That's amazing. That is absolutely the perfect way to kick off this talk about photography. 
with that incredible picture. I actually, I like the Liberace thing. I would, I would think I'm going to bring it back. It's good. <laughs> All right, so now that we all know each other a little bit more and hopefully everyone who's watching or listening feels like they know who they're going to be listening to for the next hour, um, I'll share a little bit about uh, some of the things I was thinking about when we first uh, started to set up this call. Um, because I know it's kind of probably an interesting time for photography. I know that most people who are watching right now probably do a lot of taking pictures because we all have smartphones and we're all snapping pictures all the time. Uh, when I go to an event, I know that like I'll take a picture of the food, I'll take pictures of my friends, and I feel like I'm taking all these pictures. But often, at the end of the day, when I go and look at my pictures, I feel like I didn't really capture what happened there. And even though I take hundreds, sometimes I see uh, photos like what Hive New York. So if you can go to Hive New York's website right now and click on their portfolio, and you'll see a bunch of incredible pictures and they're not of the food and they're not of the balloons but somehow you see them and you feel like you really understand the heart of what's going on at those events and for so many of us who are throwing events and trying to explain to people all the time what we're doing and where we're coming from having a picture that does that feels really important and you can tell the difference when you see it but don't always know what really is at the heart of that difference so luckily we are here with as I said Angela and JP from 100 cameras we're going to tell us about 100 cameras, what it is, how they got started, and how we can all uh, use photography to tell better stories and um, share what we're, what we're doing at our events. So Angela is the founder of 100 Cameras, and so I'm going to start uh, with you for this first question, which is, can you tell us the story of 100 Cameras? How did this start? Where did it come from? Yeah, so um, it started about five years ago in 2008. I am um, actually only one of the founders. There were four of us at the time. Um, and it started with kind of just this whole idea that how can we empower kids to make a difference? How can we help them understand that their story matters, their perspective is powerful, and that they can help provide some of these important needs in their community? It was during a time when a lot of foreign aid was being poured into communities and we really kind of wanted to explore uh, more of the empowerment model and not just with adults but also with kids and helping them learn at a young age that they can be a part of um, shaping who they are, sharing how they view the world and making a difference. Um, it started pretty simply and um, one of the co-founders was a really talented photographer and she had the initial concept idea of getting cameras into the hands of kids. Um, kind of the heart behind that was you know, when she would travel, she always felt like she was pointing the camera in kind of from the outside looking in. So the idea was if you can teach a kid how to take an image and then they can document that. That's such a true, beautiful version of reality. And then from there, we started to build out more of the model. Um, I had worked in some local development initiatives and two of the other founders were also very talented in different areas. So we kind of started to shape 100 cameras as it is today. Um, we tried the concept in South Sudan first, and um, to be very honest, we were just testing an idea at that point. Um, there was no 501c3, there was no photojournalism curriculum fully hashed out and beautifully written. Um, the, the whole model wasn't fully fleshed out, we just kind of wanted to see if it would work, if kids would respond well to this, if local partners um, such as an orphanage or a community center would, if that would be a great infrastructure to work with, so we just tried it. Um, so one of the co-founders went, tried it, she came back, and we were sitting around um, a kitchen table. Um, we had all just kind of moved to New York within the past few years. And we were looking at these images, and I actually kind of want to share. Um, I'm going to do a screen share here. Isn't technology awesome? And let's see here. So we were looking at a lot of these images. Um, is, that, is that working good? Can you see? Okay. I think so. Um, and let's see, I'll start with this one. We were kind of just scrolling through them and we were just completely blown away by um, just the perspective of these kids, how much of a beautiful raw um, portrayal of the reality that it was. And they still were kids. Um, you know, they're still being kids. They may be living in some pretty extreme circumstances and experiencing some grave situations, and a lot of them have overcome some very traumatic, hard things in their lives. But as you can see in this one, which is such a delightful one, um, they still have such joy, and they still have such hope. Um, and so we really 
realize that this was something very powerful. Um, this would actually was the one that gripped me the most um, about five years ago. It's um, a kid, Kaden, who's running through the fields, which is through some laundry hanging in a field, taking a photograph of another kid running alongside her, and that just gripped me in a way that only an image can do. Um, and really only in the way that an image from a kid can do. It's just such this raw, beautiful um, depiction of, of life and joy. And um, I'm going to unscreen share here. And so that really, I think, changed us in a way where we realized that we had tapped into something and um, it made us want to respond and act. So we cleared out all of the furniture in a tiny apartment in New York City and invited literally everyone we knew. Um, I think we installed probably over 50 frames in our apartment. Um, one of our roommates, we thought we were a little crazy probably, but she was super supportive because we literally nailed all of those frames into our walls and created a gallery in a tiny apartment and invited everyone we knew. Um, probably over 80 people came that evening, even people we met on the street, no lie. And from there, everyone had kind of the same response. They responded not out of um, pity or not out of sympathy, but out of oh my goodness, how can we help keep that kid joyful? How can we help that kid create a different path for themselves or their community? And so that's when it kind of started to grow. Um, someone who attended the event that night had a connection at the Time Warner Center, and we did our first big exhibition with Samsung there, started our next project in New York City, and began to really kind of build out a model. And a lot of it was a little bit of live and learn of what works when working with local partner communities, what works when working with kids. Um, we then started to meet some other teammates who have been around for a couple of years, JP included, um, who were just really core builders and really helped take the mission and build out the model and take it to the next level um, to create 100 cameras as to what we know it as today. And yeah, that's really kind of our story of how we came about. and. Um, we just really, really believe that a kid can learn young, that they can make a difference, and that their perspective is powerful. And we believe photography is such an important um, and exciting tool to use for that. That's amazing. And those pictures were unbelievable. I cannot believe they were taken by a kid. That's so crazy to me. Um, I was just curious about, um, do you guys give a bunch of cameras to the kids or like loan them? Um, how does that part of it work? Mm -hmm. So in the very beginning, we um, basically did camera drives and took secondhand cameras to the countries and let the kids use them. Um, and then as we've kind of evolved and grown, we were fortunate to have a camera sponsor, Leica, who um, gave us cameras to use with the kids in the field. And then Kodak, we were able to receive a bunch of brand new donated cameras from Kodak as well. So those are the cameras that we leave in the field. Um, so the kids all have access to a camera. Um, and then now they're learning on exceptional technology, which is always such a wonderful thing to be able to um, let them experience and teach them with. That's amazing. Um, so you touched on this a little bit in your story, in the story of 100 cameras, but I was wondering uh, why you think it's important for individuals, organizations, kids, everyone to be able to share their story. Like, what is the power there? Oh, gosh. The power in the story. Um, it's... I, th I think the power is that it lets people into behind the scenes um, to really see the narrative, to see what's going on, that no matter what the brand is doing or what the product can do or what the person's trying to express, when we utilize photography and we share our story and whatever means that may look like, it's, um, it's letting people engage into a narrative that ties them into it. I think that makes them relate, um, kind of gives a little bit of a humanity aspect to it, and it makes people want to join you in that. It makes people realize that um, you are a person and I'm a person, and um, we're all just trying to move forward and do something. And I think it's a very connecting, a connecting piece. I think that's <laughs> very, very true, especially working with such like global communities as you do and as we do in the WebMaker community. It's definitely the power of a picture to connect and make you understand that kind of there's a similarity everywhere. That's amazing. I want to mm -hmm. just add to that. Um, if I could quickly, I think, you know, one of the things that's been most striking to me as we go out and we teach uh, uh, the kids in, in all of the variety of places we've been 
you know, to give you a sense, uh, a lot of these kids have never touched a camera before, uh, before their first class with us. And what I've been really been made aware of is that we take for granted um, that we can tell our stories, that we have that, uh, have the avenues to be able to do that. And one of the really striking things uh, when these kids are able to take pictures and when we are looking at those pictures and uh, we're really validating their voices and I, I really uh, see just how little of an opportunity they're given to um, have somebody hear what they have to say or look at their perspective or ask them questions about it or you know when Angela's sitting uh, uh, one of the kids down to ask them what the story is of their life we sometimes become aware that nobody has actually ever done that with them and uh, it's just uh, it really does have me get present to how crucial that is for each of us to be able to tell our story and to have uh, mediums and avenues by which we can do that. Um, that's really interesting, JP, because what do you think are the key components to creating a photograph that will tell a story? Um, well, I think, you know, emotion is certainly a, a very core element to telling a story. Um, and there are so many different ways in a photograph for that to come across. So, of course, we have the more obvious things like, um, you know, the, the, a facial expression. That, that would be sort of the most tangible, straightforward way of communicating emotion in a, in a photograph. Uh, but there are so many other ways as well. And one of the first areas I go to, of course, is composition. So if we look at the image, the last image that Angela showed with uh, the boy who was running through the field, we didn't actually see his face in that picture. But there's so much emotion that can be read into that, um, whether that's excitement or, you know, um, motion or, you know, there's all of these... Uh, all of these things that can be read into um, uh, that particular image, again, even though we don't have that very obvious sort of facial expression. So the two things I would uh, point to are facial expressions and then also composition and how those can be used in a variety of ways to, to tell a story about what's happening. And I also want to point to how pictures play together. Um, because, and it was really great, the images that Angela showed, um, and I'll continue talking about the last image that she showed, but I read that last image as a happy image, uh, whereas if I had just seen that image by itself, I may not have read it in the same way, but I was reading it in the context of all of the other images that she showed, and she showed pictures of kids playing, and kids laughing, and kids smiling, and so that last image, for me, was really an image of joy, and, and movement, and play, um, so there's also an element of how you put images together and how they comment on each other and what story are you telling with a series of images as well. So thinking that about in the context of, you know, many people who are listening in this call, so, you know, the idea is to tell a story and you spoke about it as well when you said when you first go out to these communities, you know, what do you sit down and talk to these, these children about, about the composition, what they should be looking for? And how can we apply that to events that we're running? Yeah, I, um, so event photography is, you know, a particular kind of photography and there's there's certain things to be to be looking for when you're photographing events that and there is definitely some overlap in terms of what we're uh, teaching the uh, kids uh, in our classes. Um, so you know one of the things that I always say um, when I'm, whenever I'm teaching anybody about event photography, uh, and this applies to a lot of different kinds of photography, but I always say follow the laughter. Um, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of things with event photography that you want to avoid, and let me talk about that first. So one of the things you want to avoid is definitely people eating, right? Because that's awkward. Like you, you never just, ha yeah, yeah, having, <laughs> those never come out good. Um, and often actually pictures of people laughing um, also can come out really awkward as well um, just because the facial expressions can be really weird. Sometimes those come out great but, but not always. So when I say follow the laughter, what I mean by that is uh, when I'm photographing events, um, often the best outcome will be when I'm really just listening 
for people to be laughing. And I follow the laughter. And what I mean by that is that moment, right, right after people laugh, uh, that is typically when people have the most genuine smiles on their face. Um, and I'm not saying that uh, event photography is all about photographing people smiling, but that certainly would be uh, the first thing that I would point to just as a technique, as something to be looking for and actually listening for. Because being a great photographer is not just about what you're seeing, but it's also what you're hearing. And if you're, uh, like I said, following the laughter, you're getting uh, quite often that's a really great way of uh, capturing the joy that is happening at any event uh, that you're taking pictures of. Nice. That's awesome. I love, that's a total, totally tweetable line there, follow the laughter. Um, feel free to tweet that, guys. It's perfect. <laughs> um, I have more questions stemming from that, but I also see that we've received a question from Andy Dharmawan, um, kind of touching on some of the stuff we were talking about earlier. They just want to know what kind of camera uh, do you guys provide to the kids who are using, who are learning photography? Uh, I'll, so, yeah, I'll, <laughs> we can both answer that one, but I'll take it. Um, so uh, we provide right now uh, Leica point and shoots. Um, so cameras come in, you know, I would categorize them in three different sizes. So point and shoot, uh, and then what are called mirrorless cameras, which are somewhere in the middle, and then we have bigger, what are called SLR cameras. So the cameras that we provide them are maybe a little bit bigger than what might fit in your pocket. So uh, what we might consider more advanced point and shoots. So they are point and shoots that allow you to change uh, various settings, like the aperture and the shutter speed. So they're smaller cameras, uh, which are helpful for us because we travel with them, uh, but they do allow the kids to choose and change a variety of functions as well. And we awesome. did that in the beginning just for, I mean, the, the communities that we work in, um, it was part also just a choice for, for safety and that the kids can fit it into their pocket when they need to, should they need to. Um, and that was really at, um, kind of just through conversations with our partner organizations that, that helped us really um, choose that route. And I think it's proven to be helpful, as JP was kind of mentioning, because a lot of these kids have never held a camera before. So something that's digestible, like a really advanced point and shoot, is um, works really well in the field for with the communities that we work with. I can imagine that works really well. And I very coincidentally, we've received another community question on discourse um, that ties into a question that uh, I have myself, which is about uh, camera phones, which is not everyone has access. I'm sure maybe these are the bane of a photographer's existence, um, but sometimes there's like a great moment you don't have a good camera or you don't always have access to um, a proper camera. And I know there are options, there are still like disposables out there, but we all have camera phones. So the question from the community is how has having camera phones and apps like Instagram changed your work? Um, and my question kind of ties it to that, which is, if all you have is a camera phone, what are your options? So it's kind of a two-parter. Um, well, I'm going to say, uh, I know Angela's probably got quite a bit to say about this as well, but Angela and I are both huge fans of, of our um, phones, of our iPhones, and I know we use them a lot when we're traveling. And, um, you know, particularly because we travel taking pictures with iPhones is just so much more uh, practically doable uh, than if Angela or I tried to carry with us an SLR. Um, I think that, you know, if we could just break it down to what is the most uh, sort of, you know, way obvious thing, but we kind of forget this sometimes, iPhones are portable. So, um, you know, it's, they're, they're vastly portable. What you're going to take, it, better to have a picture with um, the smaller camera that you have versus not have a picture at all just because, you know, you don't happen to have your bigger camera. Um, but outside of just the portability factor, uh, phone cameras are, uh, actually provide us with a lot of things that regular cameras don't. Now regular cameras are great and there's a lot of advantages to them but where iPhones have taken just a quantum leap forward and cameras haven't really caught up yet is in the software and you pointed to it uh, earlier in the call was Instagram uh, and all of the apps that we have uh, access to and th that's that's really the advantage uh, to an iPhone I can't take a picture with my SLR and then make immediate changes to it and 
directly upload it to Facebook, where as uh, with my iPhone, I can do all of that. And we might sort of dismiss that as, oh, well, that's just sort of, you know, silly sort of fun stuff. But uh, from uh, our perspective, we, we really utilize those things quite a lot. There's nothing better than being able to take a picture of the kids that we're teaching, um, apply a filter so that we don't have to spend a lot of time in Photoshop and instantly upload that to Instagram. It's phenomenal because we get to share that with our audience and that's only um, you know, doable on an iPhone and right now I can't do that with my SLR. So there's advantages to both um, and uh, I, I encourage people to use uh, whatever they have, certainly. What are yeah, I hear your pro filter, filter. which, which <laughs> they don't have to ask <laughs> Um, um, and I, and I, oh, can oh, you guys hear Yeah. It's doing it's a little doing bit a little of a feedback. Um, um, maybe if the maybe rest of us talk when they're not talking, talking, we'll talk yeah. about it. Okay. Um, oh, good. Totally fixed. All right. So um, I just wanted to kind of tag on to that on the community aspect of it. And, you know, while it's always personal preference, we went through the same conversation we first started of do we use analog or digital, um, do we use film or digital and all of that stuff and um, we really just kind of tried to stay true to what is our purpose and what is our mission and if it's, and I would encourage everyone to kind of think through that on their own personal level of what is your what is your goal that you're trying to share and how you're trying to communicate that and there may be some people whose purpose like film does speak to that or digital does or mobile photography does and um, I really just encourage people to own that and to work within that for us the community aspect is huge um, just to be able to you know Instagram has done huge things for kind of the community aspect of photography and other apps and experiences such as that that social media has done and that's really important for us and I think to be able to if our whole goal is to equip kids to share their perspectives um, and then to share those perspectives with the world we have to kind of think a little bit forward with that and progressively with that and so for us, the community aspect of um, mobile photography and even apps on social media is huge for us being able to accomplish our mission on a much larger scale. And when we look at it like that, it's very exciting um, and it seems a little limitless of just how much more that can continue to grow. Um, and, you know, JP is exactly right. The technology is so quickly improving and growing that um, we're able to capture some really powerful shots on phones these days. Yeah, social media really has kind of opened the scope of who can attend your event post post event, you know, by being able to see the story and photos. So thinking about that as I go to plan my event, is there is there any way I can plan my photographs? Like plan the story that I want to say? Is there any kind of tricks or tips here pre event that I can start with? Um well you know well, I'm gonna you know, say about um I think one of the things that I really think about w with uh, 100 cameras that I think is applicable to any event that you're planning is to think through, I think this is really helpful for any photographer who's trying to tell a story, whether it's an event they're doing or, or what have you, is to think through what the story is before the event. So with 100 cameras, we have, a, a, I mean, Angela has done such a phenomenal job of creating our story, and she, she is our storyteller, and she teaches the storytelling curriculum, and she, she's masterful at it. Um, but even for those people who, who um, don't have a lot of experience with it, just thinking through what your event story is. What, what is it? Is you know education that is a story. Imparting wisdom is a story. Um, joy and uh, fun at at, a, at an educational event uh, that is a part of the story. Um, for 100 cameras, you know, a big part of our story is the joy um, of the kids of being able to play um, and the joy that we get out of being able to be with the kids and, and share photography with them. So I know when we have a photographer with us, those are the things that the photographer is looking to capture and they're looking out for because they know that that's our story. So if you are creating an event, and I'm speaking to the listeners now, if you're creating an event, it really is worthwhile, I think, to sort of articulate at least a little bit um, what your story is. What, what is the story of your organization or what is the story of the event? And uh, if you have that articulated beforehand, 
you can really be looking out for those moments um, as you're taking pictures that tell that story. Um, for example, one of the things that uh, I know planning an event, and I know we've done this with 100 cameras, when we plan something that is bigger than what we've done before, just the planning of it is a part of our story. It's like, wow, we actually did this. We actually created an event where 500 people attended, whereas before our biggest event was 100 people. And so, you know, for us, a part of telling that story might be going in to take pictures of the space or us setting up the space, right, because that was a part of the achievement for us. And so, uh, again, I think articulating the story beforehand uh, to yourself, even if it's just in a few sentences, kind of guides your photography as you're, when you're actually at the event taking pictures. That's quite a nice tip, you know, to take photographs pre-event, you know, because it kind of shows the effort that you're going to and what you're trying to set up. And how would you then wrap up your event? You know, your what would your final what would what would your focus be for some final pictures? Like if it was an educational event. Well, you know, people are all for events, uh, and this is true. Um, you know, for all kinds of events, but particularly for educational events, people are in such a good mood at the end of the event because, you know, when people walk into a room, there can be a little bit of nervousness if, if everyone doesn't quite know each other yet. And over the course of an event, people are, you know, starting with small talk, getting to know each other, exchanging business cards or not, you know, whatever that looks like. But the end of an event is really a good time and opportunity to take advantage of. People are now more comfortable. They are, um, you know, they're they're more at ease uh, in their bodies and with each other and so uh, at the end of the event is a great time to just walk around the room and whether you're doing the posed shots or trying to capture some candid images and I can talk more about that a little bit later in the call candid versus posed but it's a great time I think to take advantage of that people are more comfortable than when they walked in the room. So I think really uh, getting focusing on, pe on the people at the end I think is a great uh, strategy. That's nice. Yeah, I think if you don't mind if you could go into the kind of, because that was going to be my next question, was the pose versus relaxed photo. You know, people say it's very cliche to have like these pose uh, pictures, but sometimes they're needed, you know, if you need to get a certain dynamic of your event across. So how do we fold, how do we avoid those pitfalls? Um, so I, you know, I categorize images for myself into two categories. One is uh, safe images, I'll call them, and the other is risky images. And posed photos are safe images. And what I mean by that is the people that you're taking a picture of, they are standing in front of you, they are smiling at the camera, you're counting to three so they know when you're going to take the picture, you're going to take a few of them hopefully so you can edit out any images where people have their eyes closed or a weird expression or what have you. And then uh, risky images, I would call those candid images and what I mean by that is, um, you know, you're not having people pose for you. And I, I know I'm stating the obvious but I want to just sort of create a foundation here. Candid images are riskier in that you are walking around a room and you are trying to capture moments. And, you know, I, I've been doing event photography for, for some time now. I consider myself relatively good at it. And I will tell you that for some events, I will shoot 20 candid images and only one of them will come out in the way that I want it to. So you really, I think any event photographer, if you speak to a wedding photographer, um, or a professional events photographer, uh, anyone who's been doing it for a while, they will tell you that they do a nice mix of both. And so, um, you know, any event organizer or event photographer, they, they're going to know that they have a minimum number of pictures that they, they're going to need when they walk out of the room, and they're going to want and need those images for whatever advertising purposes or marketing purposes they have. And so let's just say, for example, I'm at an event, and I know for sure maybe the, the client has told me, listen, we need 40 images. Well, I'm really going to plan for about 35 of those images to be posed shots because those are the safe shots. Those are the the ones that I know are going to come out, and those are really necessary to have. I, 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 I wouldn't advise anybody ignore those. Uh, and then I'm going to have about five of those images be candid shots, just because those are riskier, and typically just because I like to play it safe. I'm going to get all the pose shots out of the way, and then I'm going to go back, you know, I'm going to go back into the room and I'm going to play a little bit. So candid to me is more about the play of it. So I want to make sure I get the safe shots out of the way, and then I go back in. Once I have those, now I can go back in and just everyone's more relaxed, I'm more relaxed, and, and start to try to capture those candid moments. Um, but you want to have a nice mix of both. 
Cool. Um, I like I. <laughs> Um, I definitely have seen events where that candid shot is really great. There's a big um, Mozilla festival each year called MozFest, and they always do a giant shot at the end of everyone who's there looking up at the camera. It's a shot I would never think to do at events, but it's a time when a post shot completely works. So I think that's really good uh, to think about for your event. Um, when we were doing more uh, candids, was candid the one where you're like taking them when they don't know, or is candid? I get confused with those two. Yes, uh, posed is when people are uh, posed in front of you, and candid is uh, when you're uh, taking shots, and typically people are not aware that you're shooting them in that moment. Gotcha. So for candids, um, how do you make sure you get people's permission when you're going around? Because I know that if people don't really know you're looking at them and it's a big event, especially with kids, are there things people need to be careful with, or how do you make sure people are okay with it? Yeah, so, you know, this this uh, question can also be applied to uh, street photography, which I, which I do teach uh, on occasion to my students, and it's a similar kind of thing. Uh, you know, if you're out taking pictures on the street, that's something that you have to be very much aware of. Of course, not everybody wants their picture taken. The good news is that with event photography, people are, t generally speaking, much more okay with having their picture taken because um, people are at an event and if they see a person, particularly if that person has a bigger camera, um, that's one of the, that is one of the benefits I'll say of having a bigger camera is people will generally assume that you're a professional even if you're not. Um, but no matter what you're taking pictures on, if people are at an event, um, they, they typically will sort of assume, right, that pictures are being taken for the sake of the event. So you've got that going for you. Um, but I, I want to encourage people to remember that, you know, if you are being a photographer who is courteous and polite and professional, which of course we all want to be, um, I, I would say you don't necessarily always need to be asking people if you can take their picture before you take the picture. So what I will do, um, if I'm particularly if I'm trying to capture candid moments, is I might take a picture and then approach the person right directly after and say, hey, I, I just took your picture. I'm happy to show it to you. Are you okay with uh, the fact that I took your picture? Um, and to me, that has just as much professionalism in it as the person who sort of asks the question first. Um, and the downside, I'll say, to asking the question first is when you do that, um, often it makes people self-conscious. So if you're, you know, that's, there's a trade-off there. So if you're hoping to really get some nice candid, shot, candid shots, my recommendation is um, just get in there, take some pictures, and if, if appropriate, uh, then get in there and ask, um, you know, ask permissions sort of right after you've taken the picture, if that makes sense. What about, you know, when you are set up in a venue and you know that you're going to be taking pictures, is there any, um, would you advise people to maybe put a, like, a notice on by the entry to say, look, there is, photographs going to be taken today, we are going to use them to advertise our events, or are you still kind of saying it's better to take the picture and then talk to people afterwards? No, I think, you know, that's something that's used quite often, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a great strategy to let people know right when they walk in the door. Um, and it lets people know. And, you know, one of the great things to put on a sign like that, if you're making one, is, um, you know, to, to let people know, listen, pic pictures will be taken. You know, you, you can even make it sort of more legal, like I've seen it before uh, in nature, and say, you know, you walking into this event sort of, you know, means that you are giving us permission to use your pictures. But you could also put on that sign something along the lines of, if you would prefer that your picture not be taken, you know, just speak to one of the event organizers and we'll make sure that happens. And every so often when I take pictures at an event, there, there might be someone at that event who does not want their picture taken. And so the event organizer will tell me, uh, will point out that person, and, and I'll just make sure to avoid them. So that, that's all, you know, can be managed. Um, I think a sign is a great idea if that's something that you're particularly nervous about when you're planning your event. Uh, with kids, uh, I didn't answer that question from earlier. I do think that is something that you want to be, um, I'm not going to say cautious about, and you certainly want to um, determine how you approach that based on, you know, wh whatever, uh, you know, the expectations are in the, where you live, you know, what, what your society determines is sort of acceptable in terms of taking pictures of kids. But I will say here in America, 
um, that is something that I am careful with and I will always check with parents um, either right before or right after I take the picture um, and typically parents will want to know what the pictures will be used for and a lot of parents are totally fine with it if they know that a picture is going to be going on a website to, to show an event um, that they have no problem with it but of course some some parents do and it's it's always good as a photographer to be sensitive to what those concerns might be exactly yeah taking on board everybody's needs and um, Angela I'm going to show this one of you <laughs> and so what are your methods for storytelling when you're taking pictures oh you're mute, you're muted rookie mistake um, Hey. <laughs> when I'm taking a photo, is that what the question was? Um, just in general, when you do events yourself, when you go out on tour. Yeah, I'm going to um, probably echo a little bit of JP here, but it's really asking myself, what is the narrative here that I'm trying to tell? Um, I'm a big believer that every moment has a story, um, and it's a context, it's a part of the context of the bigger story or the bigger picture, if you will, to be a cliche. And so it's really asking me, what am I trying to capture here? And then that helps me decide, is this something that, is it just a detail shot? Am I trying to capture an environment of the event or atmosphere of the event? Is it a shot that I want to include people to share kind of a narrative of what was happening at the event and what the experience was like, um, et cetera? So it's really just kind of asking that, that deeper rooted question of what what am I trying to get across here? Um, what's the purpose of the shots that I want to take as a whole? And then kind of narrowing in on getting those accomplished throughout the, the time. I love the idea of having a planned narrative uh, kind of before you start. And I've heard the term shot list, which I assume is if you're kind of thinking about the story you want to tell, you could maybe also start thinking about the exact pictures you want to see. I don't know how exact you can, you can get with a shot list. Um, and so I'll throw this out kind of to both of you, which is, um, are there any pictures that people find like particularly compelling as just like a rule of thumb, like people standing together laughing, or you should always start with a picture of the venue, um, because I know at the end you'll end up with a whole bunch of these amazing pictures and have to figure out how to put them together. So yeah, do you, either of you have kind of a shot that you always try and take, or like a couple shots that you feel like every event should have? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say that I always try to start from um, the end and work my way backwards, um, kind of showing the end result of what I want people to remember. Um, a part of that's from just my writing days as a writing major and that being grilled into my head from professors, but um, kind of starting with what you want people to remember most. And sometimes that's just one image of two people interacting. Sometimes it's a larger group candid or whatever it may be, or maybe it's just a photo of the space um, looking beautiful if that's what you really want to celebrate um, that you're trying to get across there. And then working backwards, so whatever that may look like. But I would say um, to always start with what, what you want people to remember and to be imprinted um, in their mind as they think back later um, from that event and looking at the images from that and what you wanted them to. It's, I almost think of it as, for someone who wasn't there, what do you want them to feel like they experienced with people who were there through the image? And for people who were there, what do you want to remind them most about the experience that they had? That's a great rule. Lots of tweetable lines in there as well. <laughs> JP, anything to add to that question before we go to the next? Oh, you're muted, JP. Sorry, um, uh, I totally agree with what Angela said. Um, it, it's it's really perfect. You know, I think um, without speaking to specifically what to be looking for in an image, I, I will say sort of give a strategy. I always think, you know, it, uh, as a photographer and when you are looking through a series of images, particularly that you've taken, it's very often difficult to be objective about what are the good images to pick in order to um, convey a particular message or story to your audience, whatever audience that happens to be. So my recommendation is always, 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 uh, until you sort of get a handle on being a good editor, um, have somebody else look at the images. And even if it's just a really quick look through um, to give you feedback on what they like and what they don't like, 
And you know, you may not change your mind about the images that you pick based on the feedback that you get, um, but uh, having some input on those images through another set of eyes, I think, is always always helpful. I mean, I've even when I've been editing in the past, I've had a shown a, a selection of images to somebody else, and I've had it pointed out to me, hey. Uh, JP, did you realize that image was blurry? And it was like, oh, I didn't even notice that, you know, because I was the one who took the picture, and so I'm just looking through them very quickly. And so that was a very basic example, but I think, you know, when you have somebody lo else look at the images, and it can be helpful to have somebody look at the images who was not at the event, um, just to give you some feedback on, you know, if you were to say, okay, we're trying to um, pick out the images that have it look like the people, uh, people who attended were having a great time, or were having, were trying to convey that the people who attended um, were taught a lot or got a lot out of this event. Um, get some feedback from somebody else is my uh, is my advice. And one other thing is, I think you know, as you're going through your images, people always love to see that people were having a good time. So this this is kind of the follow-up on the tip that you should follow the laughter, right? So as you're editing your images, uh, the follow-up tip from that is pick out those images where you can really genuinely see that people are having a good time. That's always good to include, and it doesn't need to be all of the images because, you know, uh, we're sometimes educational events. There, there's some seriousness and people getting a lot out of it, and so people aren't laughing all the way through, but at least throw a few of those images in there that, that really show people having fun. Awesome. I'm writing those down for my next event. Um, so I think you were like leading us perfectly into this next bit as we're coming to the end of our hour. It just flew by. Um, well, I have a qu couple of questions about kind of post-production things. And uh, Andy asked another question about how you keep teach kids about the post uh, post processing for the photos. Um, and so I have it's a double question. Like, are there any like what post-processing things do you teach the kids or post-production? Um, and also, once you've got those kind of edited or whatever you do to them, what's the best way to share the pictures? That's my double-barrel question. Yeah. Um, I'll jump in on this one at first. Oh, JP, were you going to go? Go ahead. It's um, all yours. I was just going to say um, a little bit of what we share with the kids at the end, I want to share a little bit of what we share all along and what the curriculum, how it's kind of built out. So it's um, a 15 class course and half the classes are photography lessons. So they're learning um, composition. They're learning how to tell a really, how to tell their story through photography. So aperture, shutter speed, a lot of the things that JP's already mentioned prior. And then the other part of the curriculum is um, storytelling and journalism based. So um, their first kind of, talking about and exploring through a series of activities with, with working with photographs or expressing emotions and those types of things. They're um, processing where they've been, um, what they've overcome, who they, who they are now. Then they're learning what they've learned from all of that. A lot of our kids have experienced some pretty tragic circumstances, so a lot of it is them processing what have they learned from that and how has that helped shape them into who they are now. And then the last part of the curriculum is um, we really focus a lot in on their perspective matters and they um, can have choices for who they want to grow into and what they want their future to look like and that their perspectives are going to be seen by the world. Um, their photographs will be sold and will help fund medical, educational, or just general lifeline supplies for themselves and their community members. And in that, they're learning about that post process. So they're learning that we're going to take their images um, we let them see their images, they get copies of their images, and we're going to pull portfolios that um, help tell the narrative that they've expressed throughout the course. Um, it's through just the exercises, the journaling, the photography itself, and they um, know that it's going to be um, put through post-production. Right now, they don't edit the photos themselves. That is a longer-term vision for us to work with a company that um, has a software that we can actually equip the kids with to edit those images and be a part of that post-production process, but to date, um, with where we were at as an organization and the communities we were working with in very remote villages in some of these countries, um, the technology we just didn't have with us in the field at that time for them to be able to edit their photos um, via computers, etc. So it's a little bit of where we are now, where we want to go with that. Um, JP, would you have anything to add in onto that? Yeah, we're... Uh, um 
I, everything, uh, of course, uh, that Angela said in terms of what we're providing the kids with, we, the the situations that we're teaching in certainly don't, you know, we we don't always have computers for the kids. Uh, sometimes we do, but but not often. Um, so uh, we're we're growing in that regard and and certainly exploring all of our options for how we can be teaching the kids. I think a, a big part of our an important part of our curriculum that we take, uh, that we want to be teaching the kids is very much editing and choosing the images that are their favorites. That's an important part of their voice and uh, their, you know, letting us know what images of theirs they like because that might be very different from the images of theirs that we like. Um, but at this point, um, you know, teaching the kids Photoshop or, or anything like that is, is a little ways off, but eventually we'll, we'll get to that point. Um, and you also asked about, I think, just, you know, editing the programs that I would recommend for our listeners. Um, there are a lot of, uh, well, I won't say a lot of options, but there are certainly some primary options out there, and uh, they each have their benefits. So there certainly is not one solution for all people, um, and it just really depends on how many images you're editing in a given day, a given week, a given month, but I'll just throw some out there. So certainly a free program, and now what I'm talking about is for the computer, so this is not uh, for the iPhone, and I can get to that in just a moment, but on the computer, a free program is Picasa, um, and then a not free program uh, would be Lightroom and Photoshop. So those two are made by the same company and uh, would be definitely the standard. Um, just kind of a word to the wise for anybody out there who is either using Aperture, uh, which is a program that's made by Apple, or anybody who is looking at the possibility of using Aperture. Um, Aperture will cease to exist uh, within the next year. Uh, Apple is uh, stopping that, uh, any support for that program. So if you were considering going in that direction, don't. Um, <laughs> And instead, you want to be looking at um, Photoshop or Lightroom if you're doing a lot of images and have a budget. Or if not, then Picasso would probably be a good bet. Um, and JP, and sorry, I'm just going to yeah. hop in here for a second because I see we're almost out of time. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping we can get in like our last community questions. But um, it would be great if you could send us links to all of the free programs and the uh, app editing tools. And we can put those up so everyone can see those afterwards. So yes, we have. Absolutely. Uh, two community questions left, so we're going to see if we can do 30 second answers to these because I also want to give you guys a chance to talk about how people can get more involved with 100 cameras and pursue their uh, now blossoming interest in photography. Um, so one of our uh, community questions from Twitter, for someone who wasn't there, uh, what do you want them to experience? Uh, what do you want them to experience with the people who were there through the image? So let's, um, Angela, I'll give this one to you, and we'll try and do 30 seconds. Okay. Um, oh, pressure's on. So I would say um, what we ultimately want to experience and what the power of a photograph just naturally and beautifully does is um, opens it up to where we can see a perspective through somebody else's eyes. We can see it through a different lens. Um, it kind of gets us outside of our own minds and our own way of thinking, um, whether it's through our culture, or the way we've grown up, or opinions we've formed as adults. Our whole goal, um, especially when we're sharing kids' perspectives from different countries and cultures and um, ways of life all over the world, is just to um, expose people to that in a way that, that helps them see through the lens of not only someone who lives in a different way, um, in a different country, but also through the eyes of a child. Um, it sounds a little cheesy, but there's such a wonderment um, with the way a kid sees the world. And a lot of times when I'm with these kids, or JP's with these kids, or our team is, or we're looking at their images, we're like, oh, I, I remember I used to see the world like that. And I used to see it with this hope um, and with this wonderment. And um, that's what we really want to help adults and people who are looking at these images chant channel the inner kid in a way that um, connects them to these kids in these remote parts of the world and helps them learn that they can make a difference um, and that their stories are important and they can be change makers, you know, as kids now and as adults as they grow up um, in that community. I love that, enabling them to be change makers. Nice, nice. And maybe can I ask for some quick names of sites where people can host pictures? Like if you maybe have the top two sites that you'd recommend? people can put up their pictures? 
I'd be curious to hear Angela's answers to this, actually, but I'm going to say f uh, Flickr and Dropbox would be my, my top two sort of places. Flickr free, Dropbox uh, could be a charge, but uh, th those I, I have found useful. I would say Dropbox. I pretty much live and breathe um, <laughs> through Dropbox, and so does all of 100 cameras. Um, well, everything we have. <laughs> cool. Amazing. Um, so last question, people heard about 100 cameras, they're passionate about it, they're excited about it. Uh, how can they get involved with the 100 cameras? There are so many ways. I would say the first most immediate way is just to share our story um, through your channels. And you can share kids' images, you can email us all of our contact information on our website, 100cameras.org, um, and just really get the kids' perspectives out there. That helps us grow our mission and help these kids create change on a larger scale. There's um, definitely some specific ways to get involved. Um, you can buy an image, you can buy a kid's product, and that's directly funding those needs in that kid's community. Um, we also are looking for different product collaborations. You can email us for more specific um, details about that. We'll be launching a storytelling supper campaign here in the next month and a half so you can host people in your home and celebrate the power of story and perspective. More details to come on that and then you can also get involved in just general volunteer ways through events, um, hosting events in your own community and future projects. Um, get involved with our projects themselves in the field. Um, the best way to stay in touch with all of that is follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, and sign up for our mailing list, which is also on our website. Awesome. And JP, if people are just wanting to pursue photography now, their eyes are open to all the cool things photography has to offer, how can they expand their photography skills? Well, we, uh, we do offer some online classes. I'll include some links uh, in for those on the uh, materials that we'll send out or, or make available after this uh, webcast. And uh, we, uh, we'll be providing a discount uh, for those online photography classes for anybody who is uh, listening to uh, this podcast. And you can check out our website as well to see other educational opportunities, whether you happen to be in New York City or really that you can take advantage of if you're anywhere in the world uh, through our online uh, classes. Amazing. So I want to say a huge thank you to JP and Angela for coming on the Teach the Web talk today. It was so amazing hearing all of your stories and all of your great tips and advice. I think I'm going to be a way better photographer. Yeah, I think we could probably talk for another hour about this. Like, it's been, you've really been really engaging and very informative. So thank you guys for coming on. Thank and you so much thanks. for having us. Yes, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. And thanks to everybody who sent in lots of questions. Um, I hope we got everybody. And if you're taking photos after being inspired by this talk, putting them up on Flickr or sharing them on Twitter, use the hashtag TeachTheWeb so that we can give uh, credit where credit is due to the amazing skills that you've learned here. Um, and if you want to keep talking about photography like I know we all do, uh, you can carry that on in the discourse page. So don't forget to, um, you can also subscribe and listen to the podcasted version of this talk that will be launching uh, the end of the first week of March, that will be up, and so if you're subscribed, that will come straight to your device, and you'll be able to listen to a slightly shortened, storified version of the talk there. So thank you so much, so much, guys. That was great. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. It was Bye. Bye.